This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Um, good news and bad news about money. Very important show today. I mean, all of our programs are important. But what our program is about today, I mean, there's so much in the news that we could have chose anything and gone off in a multiple of directions. But just FYI, what today's program is about is as you know, Kim and I always talk about gold, silver, and Bitcoin, and we're hard asset people. Real estate, we're hard asset. We control the asset. We have our, we have our assets called books and games and all that. We control our asset. And what we're gonna be talking today <clears throat> are more in the direction of paper assets. And I stay away from those things like a plague, which has limited me because I didn't buy Apple when I should have. I didn't buy Amazon when I should have, I should, you know, all that stuff. But my scotoma or my block was it. So today the discussion is going to be, how do you buy gold and silver in the paper form, primarily through uh, gold miners and possibly the paper ETFs, GLD, SLV. So the discussion is about what's the difference between the hard physical asset and the paper assets. And Kim and I are gonna be talking about this because she took she and I took three companies public, one oil, one silver, one gold. And um, you know, the Chinese, we, we found a billion dollar fine in uh, China. The communist public, the communist uh, CCP, the communist party of China, whatever those guys are, they're all from Hawaii anyway. But <laughs> the communists out of that state, they took our gold mine. You know, when some people say they steal, they steal IP and intellectual property, those bastards will steal anything. And I, so I'm not against the Chinese people, but I am against the communists, what the CCP, Communist Party of whatever it is. Call it, just call it Hawaii. But anyway, I just don't like people stealing. And the other thing is this, I was just saying the most important thing, when Kim and I took three companies public, there's an old saying that goes, if you saw what went into the making of sausage, you wouldn't eat it. <laughs> so after Kim and I saw what it took to take three companies public, all the garbage that went into that sausage, I, Kim and I swore off paper. So today's discussion is about the difference between paper, hard gold and silver, and physical gold and silver. So I guess today, I was the infant has been a friend for years. This is Peter Schiff. He's one of the smartest guys I know. Please subscribe to his Peter Schiff show. And Peter did this whole talk on Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the Constitution. I didn't know any of that stuff. And it was not for or against her. He just explained why the next Supreme Court justice is important and the difference between the Constitution and our laws. So it's a fantastic, it's the Peter Schiff show. Please subscribe to it. Our other guest is John McGregor. He's been my friend for 25 years. We're we're in neighbors in the Communist Republic of Hawaii, right next door to each other. And we both had to leave because, you know, I just didn't like wearing Mao suits and waving the Chinese flag. So anyway, and John has, is the author of one of the Rich Dad Associate books. It's called The Top 10 Reasons Why the Rich Go Broke. So, okay, we have two spectacular guests, Peter Schiff and an old friend. Now, he's not old, but he's been a long longtime friend, John McGregor and things like this. Any comments, Kim? Well, I also want to add that, um, Peter, as you can see on behind him, Euro Pacific Capital is his company, and he's the host of the Peter Schiff Show podcast. And he also has a, a book, The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy, that was written in 2014. That's all kind of coming true today. Um, but this is going to be this is a fascinating show because, yes, I have sworn off paper assets because um, – I have no control we and we haven't done well. <laughs> I remember years and years and years ago investing in, in Coca-Cola and in the stock and, and this financial planner said, oh, you should sell. You sh are you? I said, we want to sell. No, you shouldn't sell. You shouldn't sell. Hold it, hold it, hold it. We're like, no, we want to sell. No, hold it, hold it, hold it. And we held it and it crashed. <laughs> it went down and we lost money. We've lost money so much in paper. So I am a student today. I am going to be open-minded and I'm going to, I learn from, from both Peter and from John and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so, so welcome to the show, Peter and John. I'm going to start with John. Okay. So what happened, Peter, was when you, you were talking to me the last time we were on the show and I realized how close minded I was to gold mining shares plus GLD plus SLV, anything paper I've sworn off. So yeah. I called my friend, John. 
And I said, John, check out your Upper Pacific company and da 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 da. And he just called back in a few minutes and says, fantastic. You invest in it. So our question today is what made your mining your uh, paper so good? So John, why don't you answer that question first? Why did you say it was a clean buy or a good, something, something you should invest in? Well, first of all, I, I mean, I, I, full disclosure, I am a shareholder in the Euro Pacific Gold Fund. And, um, and this is not a recommendation for anybody. I cannot make recommendations. There's a lot of factors go in to people deciding on what they should, what they should buy. But when, when you turn me on to this, Robert, it really intrigued me. Um, not only because of the way the fund is structured and because of, of Peter's leadership and, and management, but it's really a play on the goal. And I think um, we're looking at the perfect storm that's brewing, uh, is brewing for substantially higher gold prices. And I think this just could, this could be just the beginning. Well, what, specifically, um, what, what specifically about the Euro Pacific Gold Miner Fund? Yeah, what, what did you look for? Because I don't even know what know. questions so we to are, ask. We're, we're blind. Yeah. So for somebody looking at it for the first time or any gold mining stock. Yeah. So you want to look at long-term history of, of performance, consistent performance. Um, you want to look at really the management of the, um, of the fund itself. You want to look at expense ratios of how much that's going to cost. But for me, it was really a play in this current environment. It was a play on gold going higher, which I believe it will. And, um, and I believe Peter has one of the, the you know, there's limited uh, supply of these gold mining uh, mutual funds. And again, I'm a, I'm a firm believer in Peter. So um, it was a no brainer for me. And it was highly rated by other analysts that are much smarter than me. So. Yeah. And John, as a financial uh, planner for all, you used to train financial planners. I'll forgive you for that someday. But anyway, <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot of flaky funds out there, aren't there? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's over 20,000 different mutual funds of all shapes and sizes doing all kinds of different things. Yeah, no question. And, and they're priced differently and they're managed differently. Um, but for me, this was a play in the gold sector. So how, do, how would somebody know? I mean, of course, we're not asking for, your ex, for all of your knowledge, but on a very basic level, how would you know a good fund from a bad fund? Well, um, a, a lot of it is based on the, uh, the management within the fund. You want to know that they have a long-term track record in, uh, in successfully managing money on behalf of their clients. And the other key thing for me is in fees. Um, fees, in, in my opinion, can be the great destroyer of wealth over time. And a lot of these funds um, are very highly priced and, and very difficult to really discern how much those what those prices are just by looking at a prospectus, which is, you know, it's a 50 page book of very tiny, tiny font that's meant to confuse investors. Um, so fees are very, very important. And, uh, and, and, and then I look at other analyst ra ratings of the funds as well. And, and, and you know, it's just, it's a, it's a collaboration of a lot of things that I look for um, when deciding what type of fund um, to invest in. So, so Peter, you know, uh, when John recommended your, uh, I've known you for years, but I still checked you out. And it came so highly rated, and I and, and I do rec I, I recommend everybody subscribe to the Peter Schiff show, simply because Peter is an educator. You know, he has he's always selling something, but he educates more than he sells. So, Peter. Anyway, with that said, um, you opened my eyes to the differences between paper, which is a gold mining sh share, and you compared GLD, which is a mutual fund. And then Kim and I are definitely hard asset. We only, we, we, we got to see, touch and feel the metal. So what do you have to say to us? Well, you know, first of all, stocks and bonds are thought of as paper assets. I mean, because, you know, way back when you would get a paper share certificate, right? For your stock or the bond was written on a piece of paper. But if you think about it, the real paper assets are bonds, right? Because all bonds are is where you're promised to be paid pieces of paper by other people. You've loaned them dollars or some other currency, and they're going to pay you back in that paper. But even though you could have a paper share certificate in a stock, you actually own the business. You don't own the entire business. I mean, you would if you bought up every single share, but you own a fractional portion of that business. And to the extent that that business is comprised of hard assets, well, then you own a piece of those hard assets. And so when it comes to a gold mining company, the primary asset of a gold mining company 
is the gold in the mines, right? The gold that is still in the ground that they haven't dug up yet. And, and so if you're bullish on gold, you want to own a gold mine. You want all that gold, especially when you look at how these gold mining stocks are priced, you're actually getting a lot of gold for free because the market doesn't assign any value to a lot of the reserves because based on the current gold price or based on the projected gold price in the future, the market doesn't think those reserves have any value because they don't think they're gonna get mined. But if you end up getting a big rise in the price of gold, which is what I expect to happen, all of a sudden reserves that the market valued at zero suddenly become very valuable. And so if you buy the stocks now before that value is reflected in the share price, you can make a tremendous amount of money. And in answering your question about, I think what makes a, a good gold fund versus a, a run of the mill gold fund, I think most gold funds are really closet indexers, meaning what they're doing is they're just trying to replicate the performance of an index like the GDX uh, or the you know, XAU. And anybody could do that. I mean, I mean, you don't have to what, charge. What's the GDX and SAU? Well, th th those are publicly traded uh, ETFs that just own a fixed basket of, of, of gold mining stocks. And what a lot of managers want to do is just they don't want to risk underperforming that index. So they kind of copy it. But you're really not getting any value for your money. Anybody could just buy the index. I think what's so unique about our fund is we really look for the value that the indexes are missing. That's why when I started my gold fund, I hired Adrian Day, because it's a very specialized field uh, to really understand. And I didn't understand that. I mean, I'm bullish on gold, but I'm not a geologist. And I mean, I haven't been doing this for 40 years like Adrian has. I mean, he actually goes down there and he's been to the, to the mines. He knows the management uh, teams, the hey, companies, Peter, the Peter. projects. You know, by the way, you know, when Kim and I were starting out in becoming gold miners, definition of a gold miner is somebody standing next to a hole in the ground that's lying all the time. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. And Adrian knows who's lying. <laughs> <laughs> so, being so, honest. so our our partner was Frank Crary, who's the greatest guy we've ever met, man. He <laughs> he took he took so many com mining companies public. Now not all of them worked, but he had to he, all, he always said to us, he always said to Kim and me, he says, I'm interested in my lies and the other guy's lies is my lies come true. <laughs> yeah, well and, and, and the thing is that is the value add. I think wait, 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 so, Adrian, wait, 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 let me finish. Yeah. So Adrian Day, he respected Adrian Day. That's that's how when you said when I saw Europe Pacific Capital had Adrian Day as one of the guys inside the management, I said, that's good. John verifies that. What we're doing is educating and we're gonna help hopefully sell some Euro Pacific capital. Full disclosure, Kim and I invested some money in it, but we had to change our thinking. So anyway, that's really what I want people to know. Adrian Day is extremely well known. And Frank, our, our partner Frank, as he said, the difference between my lies and your lies, my lies come true. But that's what it takes to start a gold mine. And a sulfur. Yeah, he's, well, he's very well known in this, in this field because he's been managing separately managed accounts his you know entire career and he's been beating all of the publicly traded mutual funds it was because his long-term track record was so good so much better than everybody else that i that i sought him out as soon as i started my fund i'm like i got to get adrian day to be the manager and he started out as the sub advisor but i eventually brought him on board he now works at europe pacific asset management and so we're managing the fund in-house now but Adrian is the portfolio manager that manages the fund. We actually also offer separately managed accounts where individuals own a gold mining stocks directly where Adrian manages those portfolios. Right. So John, that's when you, when you say as, as a financial advisor, you're looking into the management, the track record, the fees. So yeah. if you saw, if you are in the gold mining industry, as Kim and I were, you see Adrian Day, you go, this is good. And what, was that, that what you're saying? Absolutely. And, and just so you know, I own physical gold, I own gold ETFs, and then of course I own Peter's fund. And the, the challenge for individual investors are saying, they're thinking to themselves, well, I think gold's going to go up too. How do I participate in this? And a fund like the Euro Pacific Gold Fund is an excellent way to do that because 
you may be looking at gold mining stocks and Robert, you and I talked about Barrick Gold uh, as an example. And, and, and which, which, Buff, Barrick, which, which Buffett just bought into Barrick. Buffett. TK is Peter Monk's company. Yeah, which is an amazing sign of now that Buffett, who has trashed the gold sector my entire financial career, has now trimmed banking stocks. He's trimmed out, he's, he's sold out of, not sold out, but he's trimmed his holdings in banking stocks. And now he's buying Barrick Gold, which is really inter interesting to me. It's almost like he's betting against the US economy. But the, the question for people is, well, how do I participate in, uh, in, in, in the gold sector if I like these gold mining stocks or I like gold in general? And you know, do I, go, do I go into Barrick Gold or do I go into some other gold mining? company. And the reason that owning this fund is, is a great way to do it is because you can, you can put $1,000 into it or $10,000 into it, what, what ha, whatever you choose, and your money is instantly diversified amongst a variety of gold mining stocks that Adrian Day has gone out and kicked the tires on and has determined which are the best for this particular fund. So you have instant diversification amongst the best gold mining stocks. That's why I think this is a, a so great let's, idea. Let me bring one more thing up that, that I liked about, see, Buffett bought into Barrick, which is a major, 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 it's the biggest, it's Peter Monk's company. But, but what Euro Pacific Capital does, you have juniors. And a junior are the ones that are coming up fast right now. And yeah, I like, and, and I in fact, like, you know, like fun. we have a very diversified portfolio that includes the major companies like Barrick Gold. That is one of the stocks that we own. We also own a lot of these royalty companies, streaming companies, which take a lot of the risk out of the mining business because they don't own any of the costs. They just get a royalty on whatever gold is produced. Yeah, that's yeah. a big, big thing there. Just the royalty, you got no risk. You got this cash flow coming in all the time. Isn't that Franco? Yeah, well, your uh, risk, the price of gold could go down, but it's significantly less risky than operating a business where all sorts of stuff can go wrong. You know, there's a lot of risk in gold mining stocks, as there is in any business, which means that when you own gold stocks, it's a much different animal than just owning the physical metal. There's more downside, but there's also a lot more upside. And a lot of these gold stocks pay dividends. In fact, there were news last week, we had Kinross Gold for the first time ever declared a 1% dividend. I mean, a lot of these gold mining stocks are making a lot of money now with the price of gold where it is. A lot of them are gonna become cash cows uh, in this environment. But getting back to my, my, my fund, we combine the big companies, the, the royalty companies, the mid-tier companies, juniors. We have some exploration stocks in there. So really, for somebody that doesn't even own any gold stocks at all, you could just buy my fund. And right there, you're going to have a diversified portfolio across the entire sector. And, and isn't one of the reasons, back to Buffett for just a moment, Buffett and Barrick, we had this discussion a while back that one of the reasons we think Buffett bought Barrick is because he's basically going to be able to get gold at wholesale prices, correct? He's not going to be paying retail. He's going to get them at wholesale. Well, in theory, sure. He could have a deal with Barrick. He could buy the gold right as it comes out of the ground, you know, and, and, and bypass somebody like Schiff Gold, the middleman, you know, and get the gold right from the source. And, you know, my personal thinking is, Buffett's got a lot more Barrick to buy. I think he was just uh, starting when he reported his holdings. He probably has more now. In fact, he's probably buying this dip that we've had over the last couple of days. And he probably has more gold stocks that we don't know about yet because he hasn't had to disclose his positions. Okay, so Peter, we got a whole, it's time for the uh, break. And I, I want to talk about when we come back, that dip yeah. that's happening. We'll talk okay, about yeah. that. I'm it's curious. a buying opportunity. It could be. Okay. <laughs> so, once again, it's Robert Kiyosaki. Our guest today are John McGregor, Peter Schiff, and we're talking about the difference between physical gold and paper gold. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the show, radio show, the good news and bad news about money. And today we have two special guests, John McGregor, a dear friend of ours, certified financial planner for over 21 years. And he's is the author of the book, The 10 Top Reasons, or The Top 10 Reasons Why the Rich Go Broke. A lot of them are going broke today. And then Peter Schiff has been a friend of ours for years. We, we, we met on the Real Estate Guys uh, cruises, and it was always entertainment think, listening to Peter. I mean, get to, get to spend five days with Peter. I mean, 
you, you come off with your head exploding. <laughs> but anyway, this is a very exciting time. Once again, go to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere at iTunes or Android or YouTube. And please listen, leave us a review when you listen. And all of our podcasts are archived at richdadradio.com. Full disclosure, we don't sell anything. You know, Kim, Kim and I invest in Peter's Fund. John McGregor invests in Peter's Fund. But we don't saying you should do it because we're not advisors. And go to the Rich Dad Radio. <laughs> Uh, Rich Dad Radio. Hey, quiet now. Peter, Peter is. <laughs> <laughs> and John is. <laughs> so go to Rich Dad Radio, listen to this podcast again, and you'll learn twice as much as repetition is how you learn. But more important, have your friends, family members, and business associates, especially the Marxist, please listen to this program. <laughs> because I want to say something. Peter Schiff, the Peter Schiff show is fantastic. He's always selling. But his last couple of shows, man, I mean, you were on it about what's going on with the total macro economy, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the crash, Black Lives Matter. I mean, I had to call Peter up and I said, how in the world do you get away saying what you say? And I don't know if he's getting away with it or not, but boy, he's got guts and that he's still not deplatformed. But anyway, the Peter Schiff show is fantastic. Please subscribe to it. Thank you. And as soon as something changes, I just tune into Peter because he's got a comment on it. But he explained the difference between a constitution and uh, so the constitution and laws. I didn't know the differences. So with that said, uh, Kim, what was your question? For yeah, Peter? I had a question because, um, you know, we're, we're in for gold for the long term. And we, uh, we think also that the price of gold is going to be going up tremendously. But right now there is this big dip, kind of a got clobbered, as you said earlier, um, with gold. And I'm just wondering, as, we, as people look at gold from day to day and week to week, month to month, what causes the ups and downs? Is it, is it people physically buying and selling? Is it emotion? Is it other social factors? What is it? Well, well, you know, there is a lot of cheap money that's sloshing around thanks to the Fed. And so there's a lot of hot money in all these markets. It's not just gold that got clobbered. Everything got clobbered, right? The stock market went down uh, and gold went down as well. I mean, gold went down less percentage terms than the stock market, although gold stocks got clobbered more. There's a lot of volatility when it comes to the gold stocks, but I expect the gold stocks to come roaring back even stronger uh, than the overall market. But you know what was the catalyst for this decline was the failure of the Fed to convince the markets that more stimulus is coming. I mean, more than what they've already promised. What the market was waiting for was for the Fed to come out with something additional, some more QE. To keep uh, everything propped commitment. up. To yeah, keep it all and, but up. a lot of it has to do with the political logjam that has tied up the next round of fiscal stimulus, which, of course, the Fed is going to monetize with more monetary stimulus. So because we're not getting this fiscal stimulus, that means the Fed isn't going to be printing as much money to finance that stimulus as the markets had anticipated. And so the markets are, are selling off. But of course, none of this is good for the economy. All the stimulus actually sedates the real economy. All it is is inflation. And yes, it can prop up nominal asset prices, but at the expense of undermining the real economy, what you really should be buying as a result of all this is gold, is silver, and are these gold mining stocks. And you know, the bad news is we're gonna get more stimulus, right? It's not gonna help the economy, but it is gonna push the price of gold substantially higher. And gold stocks, I think, will disproportionately benefit from that gain, which is why you know, we own them. Okay, John, as, as a financial planner, when you look at the paper asset of the stock market and bond market, so what's your thoughts on the sell-off, John? Yeah, right now, I think it's just a head fake. And Peter will tell you, and I've been saying this uh, as well, in any, the, the biggest moves in a bull market are on the downside, and the biggest moves in a bear market are on the upside. So I think this is just a head fake, and I think these are buying opportunities for both gold and equities. Um, I mean, we saw gold, we've seen gold sell off recently, and a lot of that's because we've seen a strengthening in the dollar, as well as the stimulus concerns that, uh, that Peter mentioned. But I, I am very bullish on, on gold for a lot of reasons. Um, I mean, like I said, I think the, it's a perfect storm brewing, and this is just the beginning. Um, I mean, the, the fundamental factors driving this uptrend, I mean, we've got this, this pandemic, this COVID pandemic, we have no idea how long this is going to last. We've got uh, the potential for renewed trade wars on global GDP. We've got increased stock market volatility. We've got uncertainty around arguably the most important presidential election 
we've ever seen, which is really a fight between socialism and capitalism. And then we've got negative interest rates in Japan and, and several European countries, as well as extremely low interest rates here in the US. And the Fed is, Fed's got a huge bias towards inflation. And, and as we all know, gold is widely considered an inflationary hedge. And, and the Fed expects to leave rates near zero through 2023. And so all of these factors, and then we've got a demand issue. We, we, we saw a, a, a fall off of supply available in gold earlier this year. So all of this, you combine all of this, and I think, I think we're looking at a, at a bull market in gold, and I think this is just a buying opportunity. So Peter, may I ask you a question on that? Because John brought up something. Is there's a lot of rumor that COMEX and all this stuff, which I don't know much about, they're short of physical gold. Is that true or false? Yeah. Although, you know, first of all, I wish this election was about capitalism versus socialism. Instead, it's about how much socialism we're going to have. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. you know, the, 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 the problem with the COMEX and all of the paper trading that goes on, a lot of people that trade in gold, I'm talking speculators, not what you're doing, Robert, where you're buying uh, gold and you're, you're putting it away. You're taking physical delivery of your coins and your bars, like, you know, customers of shift gold. These are big time speculators that don't actually want any gold. They just want to gamble on the direction that gold's going to go in. And so they go in and buy gold and they use a lot of leverage, right? They put down a small amount of money and they control a significant amount of gold. So this gives them a lot of leverage to the movement in the price. Uh, and what they end up doing is they buy the gold from other people who don't actually even have the gold. They just want to bet that the price of gold is going to go down and they want to profit from the fall in the price of gold. So they go into the futures market and sell something that they don't even have to somebody who really doesn't even want to buy it. And that all works out great so long as the buyer doesn't actually want the gold. As long as these contracts settle up by expiration, everybody can keep on playing the game. But here's what's going to happen one day. The people who are buying these contracts are actually going to want the gold. And so they're not going to sell the contract around expiration. They're going to give notice to the seller on the other side that they would like delivery of the gold. Yeah. And that's where the problem comes because the short sellers won't be able to come up with the gold. I mean, there are some legitimate hedgers in there, companies that have gold that sell forward into the futures market to hedge gold that they intend to deliver. But you've got lots of people who are selling gold that they don't have. And the, what's going to happen is when all these shorts have to scramble to try to find the gold to make good on their commitments, now you have all this real buying coming into the market. I mean, right now, the, the volume of paper gold trading on the futures market dwarfs what's actually being traded in the real market. But when all of a sudden they have to come up with real gold to settle on these delivery notices, that's when the price of gold can go ballistic. And in fact, what if the sellers can't afford it? They actually can't buy the gold at the higher price. They just default on their contracts. So now what happens? Now the COMEX has to make good on those obligations. But what if the COMEX doesn't have the money? And now the COMEX goes bankrupt. And now a bunch of people who bought gold through the futures market expecting to be able to take delivery, now they find out they own nothing because the counterparty can't make good on their promise. That's, that's, that's one of the reasons that what you're doing, Peter, is you're actually selling the gold mine, not the futures contract. Is that no, you own the gold. Yeah, you own yeah. the gold in the mines. And you don't own, the, see, the problem with the futures contract is the counterparty risk. What if the counterparty doesn't have the gold to deliver and he can't afford to buy it and he goes bankrupt. So yeah, if you, sh you should buy real physical gold and take possession of it to avoid the counterparty risk. But when you own a gold stock, the risk you have is not counterparty, it's political risk. You know that because what if the government decides to seize your mine and then you don't own it anymore? They just take it from you. So that's what you have to be concerned about is the political risk of the jurisdictions where your mines are located. Uh, that hurts, Peter. That hurts. And where uh, are your minds located, by the way, Peter? <laughs> I want to just I'd like to know. So, so, <laughs> I'm going to simplify this whole thing. What a futures contract is, is, it's like Kim selling puppies and her dog's been spayed. 
That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no You're getting a future puppy. A future puppy from a dog that can't deliver. Ah. So where are your minds, Peter? I said they're in pretty safe jurisdictions in general, you know. <laughs> I can tell you another reason the fund is good is because it's diversified across the globe. I mean, it's in Canada, the U.S., Australia, South Africa, uh, Britain, and various other countries. So just another, another reason to, uh, to own that fund. Right, because that's a big question right now with these swap lines going out is that, the, you know, if, if, if uh, what's his name, Trump likes you, he'll extend a contract or a deal with you. He doesn't like you, he'll cut you off. But if he cuts off a country he doesn't like, like Indonesia, and you own mines in Indonesia, you're host. Yeah. It's so like, that's, a, that's, yeah. that's the country risk you go into here. We, we were just talking to somebody who, who is dealing only in countries where, they are swap, where there are swap lines because right. it's more stable. Yeah, I think that risk or that threat is a bit exaggerated. So I, 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 I'm not as concerned about it. And ultimately, if you think the dollar is going to go down, then none of this is going to matter. I mean, this, these swap lines are important if the dollar is strong. You're talking to somebody who had a gold mine in China. <laughs> we take it very seriously. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, Peter, you may not take it seriously. Yeah, well, you know, yeah, well, yeah, doing business in China is not easy when you're not Chinese. Well, they should have told me that before. Peter. <laughs> so, John, any comments on this whole thing about paper versus the physical? Well, I was just going to say it's no different than doing business in Hawaii. But, uh, <laughs> But no, I, I will say, um, you know, to Peter's point, I think owning the actual company is 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 a, a great way using paper assets to own these great gold mining companies. Now, look, um, and I think people should diversify, own the physical gold as well as own the paper. Um, paper is easy to get in get in and out of. It's very liquid, so if you need to get it, get out of it, you can get out of it instantaneously. But I will say. Owning a gold mining stock like Barrick Gold is is much different than just buying gold itself. Um, I mean, you look at these companies. Um, the, the, there's there's several things they have that gold does not have, including they have a balance sheet, they have an income statement, they have cash, um, they have assets, and many of which, including Barrick Gold, pays a dividend. Um, so that's why I like these gold mining stocks myself. So uh, Peter. What, how, what is the minimum? One thing I like about paper is there's minimums. You, you, don't, you don't have to buy, like Bitcoin's about 1,200, yeah. which is like 12,000 12, bucks now or something. Something like that. And silver is still under 30. But what's your minimum to get into your position? I think the minimum investment, although maybe it's different at some of the discount brokerage houses, but I think it's $2,500. I know that's the minimum if you buy the fund directly from my website at europacificfunds.com. I think that's the minimum. Although once you've invested, you can set up automatic investments for much lower than that to come out of a weekly paycheck or something. But to follow up on dividends, one of the keys about the dividends that the gold miners are paying is that these dividends are likely to go up because as the price of gold goes up, all else being equal, that incremental price just drops right to the bottom line. And it gives you a big increase in earnings which allows you to increase your dividends. You know, gold mining companies are really among the only companies right now where earnings are growing and dividends are going to go up. Most other companies are struggling to maintain the dividends they have. Their earnings are down. They're cutting dividends everywhere. And, and so if you own gold stocks, not only do you get the hedge against inflation that you get from gold, but you actually get real current income that you can spend. Because gold itself is not a productive asset. It's just a metal that will, you know, sits in a safe. But if you're running a gold mine, you're operating a business, not only do you own gold in the ground, but you're mining it and selling it for a profit. And so when you own stock, you get your share of that profit paid out to you in a dividend. And as the price of gold goes up, your dividend goes up. That's a great income stream that's hedged to inflation. Because when your cost of living is going up because of inflation, so is the price of gold. And now your dividend income goes up. So you have more income to pay the higher prices for goods and services. That's a big point, right, John? I mean, that's a fantastic difference. No question about it. No question about it. And for anybody, I would recommend not taking that dividend. Dividend. I would highly recommend people to reinvest that dividend back into that individual stock or the, uh, the mutual fund itself. Yeah, until you need the income. I mean, right. once you need the income, I mean, a lot of people could end up living off of these stocks. And 
you know, if I'm right about how high the capital gains tax is going to go, the last thing you're going to want to do is pay that tax by selling those stocks. So you're just going to hold on to them and keep collecting the dividends. So, so what is your prediction on capital gains tax? What, what's your prediction well, it's, on it's the It's going to go way season? up. I mean, give, it, us that, give it to us, Peter. Taxes <laughs> well, even if, you look, even if you look at what Biden has proposed, assuming Biden is the winner, he is proposing not only taxing uh, capital gains as ordinary income, but he wants to subject all income, including capital gains, to the Social Security payroll tax, which it is exempt from now. So you're talking about a capital gains tax rate. I think it's around 57% is really what they're proposing. And then if you live in states like California and New York, and you add that on top of it, you're talking about well above 60, 65%. But who knows, the capital gains rates could be even higher than that. We have massive amounts of debt in this country. We're racking up more debt every day. And how are we going to pay for it? Obviously, one way is through inflation, right, by printing money. Another way is by raising taxes. And we're going to get both. In fact, the Democrats are promising much higher taxes on the rich. And I have a feeling that they're going to deliver on that promise. I think the taxes will be even higher because, you know, as you tax the rich, you get fewer rich people, uh, their wealth kind of disappears. And so then you have to raise taxes even higher on the ones that remain. But the bulk of the tax is going to be the inflation tax, right, where the government just prints money and spends it instead of taxing and spending. And that's where the gold stocks give you the best hedge. You can hedge the inflation tax by getting out of the dollar. It's very hard to hedge uh, the, the income tax. I mean, unless you can move to Puerto Rico or something like that, which is where, <laughs> where I am. But other than that, I mean, you're going to get stuck with those taxes, but you won't get stuck with the inflation tax if you get rid of the dollar soon enough and get into gold, silver, and you know these mining stocks. So uh, again, the reason I have John and uh, Peter on it is because any kind of paper asset, you have to have somebody who can read the financials and all the things and analyze a good, a good uh, paper from a bad paper. So final, final words, John, on the subject. Well, I would just say, Peter, they're coming after your money soon when they make Puerto Rico another state, then, uh, <laughs> then your well, tax- they can't just make it a state. I think first the Puerto Ricans have to vote for statehood, but you know, they might do it. Uh, but you know, you, you would think that would be crazy. You would think, Hey, why would people that have no IRS, right? The IRS agents aren't in Puerto Rico. Nobody in Puerto Rico is required to pay federal income tax or the Obamacare tax. No one in Puerto Rico is on the hook for their share of the $37 trillion or $27 trillion rather national debt, right? You would think, why would they want to sign up for that? Why would they want to assume a share of that debt? Why would they want to start paying federal income taxes, especially when they're about to go way up? They're not paying them at all. Why would they want to do it? I mean, could you imagine if any state had the opportunity that Puerto Rico has right now where the state can decide, hey, everybody in your state, you can keep your American passports, you're still going to have all the rights of Americans. You can travel freely among the 50 states. You get all the military protection. You still get your Social Security. If you know, you still get, you know, you can still get all these other benefits. The only difference is you lose your congressmen and your senators. You can't vote for president. Oh, and you no longer have to pay any federal income tax. You don't have to file tax returns. You can forget about April 15th. Doesn't matter anymore. Which means if you live in a state like Texas or Florida, or Nevada, which has no state income tax, you have no income tax at all. You don't even have to keep books and records anymore. You're there you free. go. Peter right? for president. Why, why, there we go. Why would people want to, <laughs> I'm voting for you, Peter. Huh? Peter. I'm voting John, for you. John's packing his bags right now. <laughs> Peter, yeah, I'm on my way. Peter Schiff for the uh, Puerto Rican Tourism Bureau. I think that's <laughs> Yeah, but, but, you know, the Puerto Ricans might, you never know. I mean, they could vote for statehood. And they could make Puerto Rico a state. And that would be very unfortunate for the people of Puerto Rico. <laughs> but we'll see what happens. <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, John, get your final word in. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah real quick. I just think uh, people Rico. should re- really, people should start thinking down the road what's coming. As Peter and, and all of us have discussed, um, I think it's the perfect storm that's approaching, whether regardless of who's, who's in, the, in the White House and I think taxes are going to go through the roof. They're going to have to in order to pay for all of these services that have been accumulating. Um, and 
I'm very, very bearish on America going forward, sadly. And I think people need to really start preparing themselves. And I think people should really start looking at gold as a way to hedge against this catastrophe that's coming. I just want to FYI, you know, John still lives in California. I don't know why he does, but he moved from Hawaii to California. My condolences. Uh, <laughs> just, just shows his lack of intelligence. But anyway, <laughs> we're, we're at a meeting with the governor of Arizona and uh, Eric Trump uh, yesterday. And the governor gets up there and he says, I want to thank the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, because the number of billionaires in Arizona went up. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, There's a they're mass exodus California, and they're probably moving Phoenix. to Puerto Rico too. Peter. <laughs> <laughs> the billionaires are moving. Anyway, I want to thank all of you for listening to Rich Dad Radio. We come right back and come on, come and have a f- further words. So thank you, Peter, and thank you, John. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, John. Sure, Appreciate it. All right, Thanks. take Bye. care. Bye. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And I'm going to thank Peter Schiff of the Euro Pacific Fund and John McGregor. Certified financial planner and been a friend for over 25 years from Hawaii, but he left. But showing his lack of intelligence, he moved from Hawaii to California. Anyway. <laughs> and soon he'll be moving somewhere else. He's moving. Anyway, I want to thank you for the, all for listening to the program. The Rich Dad Radio is, you can listen to iTunes, Android, or YouTube. Please listen to a review. And all of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them for one reason. We don't sell anything. We, sell, we basically promote education. I think today's program was extremely educating about gold, paper assets, and all that other stuff, mining shares, and taxes, and Puerto Rico and California. Anyway, listen to Rich Dad Radio on, um, at our Rich, go to richdadradio.com and listen to this podcast again, and then ask your friends, family, and business associates to listen to it and discuss it, and your intelligence will skyrocket. So Kim and I have had the unique experience of taking three companies public with Frank. And like I said, if you saw what goes into making a sausage, you wouldn't eat the sausage. And the best thing about taking companies public through an IPO, an in, in initial public offering over the Toronto Stock Exchange, we saw what went, goes into making a stock. And that's why I was t- totally turned off. I would never touch a stock again. I mean, that included Apple. I remember my Apple was 18 bucks. I refused to touch it just because it's such a horrorous game. And Amazon, I refused to touch it. So it was Peter, because I like gold. He was, Peter Schiff was talking to me about me being close minded. So that's what today's program was about. So what did we learn from Frank? When Frank was, Frank has taken so many companies public and like he, his classic line is, he says, aren't you in my lies and your lies? My lies come true. <laughs> <laughs> well, think of the gold mine that was in China actually started as a gold mine in Peru <laughs> and the gold mine in Peru didn't work out so well. So they started looking for other mines and then lo and behold, they found this a gold mine in China that basically the government said it's yours because it's just, there's nothing to it and there's nothing there and we're not going to do anything. So we raised millions. Wait, what it was was a nothing down deal. Just like in real estate and get a nothing down deal. The Chinese were shifting from, I don't know what they were shifting from or to, but they said, we're not going to, oh, they, they weren't going to fund these mines anymore. Right, right. So all these mines were coming up, floating to the surface for free. So we found this one and we put millions, millions of dollars, raised millions of dollars, brought all the engineers in, all the, all the, did all the reports, did all the analysis. I'm, oh my God, it was a heck of an operation. And then what happens is we struck gold and lo millions. and behold, I mean, like one of the biggest, they still to this day say it's one of the biggest finds in China um, and came time to renew our permit and we needed five signatures from five politicians and we only got four. And they held out, held out, held out. And the bottom line is they basically, they wanted money. They wanted us to pay money in exchange for that fifth signature. No, but they were, they were going to take it anyway. Well, possibly so. But anyhow, it was where it started and where it ended. Um, but the one thing about Frank, Frank was a storyteller. And Frank could tell the best stories. And what I learned in terms of marketing, he, he became one of my best marketing teachers because if you can tell a story and convince people to give you money when you're basically, there's nothing there now, that's a good salesperson. And he is a good salesperson. He's a good marketer and he's a great storyteller. And he taught us so many lessons, he so would, many lessons. We'd have these investor meetings, you know, and then this is in Scottsdale. And we could say, well, we're doing really well in Peru. <laughs> Next meeting. We're really doing well in Mongolia. <laughs> and the next meeting, we have a big hit in China. And people just sat there and just gave him more money. Yep. Yep. I sat there and I said, that is this old saying. It's the definition of a gold miner 
is a hole in the ground with a, somebody standing next to it. That's all it was. We had nothing. And Frank just kept telling the story until we found gold. Yep. And, and John said it well, too, though. He said, you know, you look at the track record. And Frank had a good track record. I mean, he had taken like 70 companies public. Um, and he had a lot, and he had a lot of knowledge in the world of gold. That was his main thing. So he had a, he had a great track record too. And he had the right team. He yeah. had the right accountants, yeah. attorneys, and all this. They were really, really, really sophisticated guys off Toronto, all Canadians, because Canadian is a mining uh, nation. So it was a it was a lesson in paper assets. But like I said, it took Peter Schiff to kind of open my mind up to say maybe there's another way of looking at gold mining shares or ETFs, which I don't touch at all. But Kim and I, over the years, since for me since '64, he was starting in '64, the collecting silver, right? Silver, the the silver dimes when they started adding um, copper, copper to them. Um, I, I kept looking for the real, just the pure silver ones, and I still to this day don't know why I did that, but I still have them. I found them the other day. I still have them. And when Kim and I bought our first house, we we're living in La Jolla, California, and we didn't have a down payment, but we had a closet full of silver. Yeah. So she had to take shopping bags of gold grocery, bars, grocery right? bags of silver bars to the precious metal metal dealer. What was about three blocks away, and that's how we got our first house. So anyway, the thing about gold and silver is liquid paper uh, shares of gold mining stocks are liquid. That means you can get in and out of them pretty quickly. And and you know one other point too is you know you we can't get out of a gold mine very quickly. That's true. <laughs> Um, we said, you know, we did invest in Peter's fund. And one of the ways that Robert and I learned best is we put a little money down. So if we put some money down, then sure enough, we're going to pay attention. So we put some money into his fund and we're going to learn more about how the fund operates, what works, what doesn't work. But that's a, one of the one of the key ways that, that we up our education. So once again, I thank to Peter Schiff and uh, his, he's the author of The Real Crash America's Coming Bankruptcy and How to Save Yourself and Your Country. And John McGregor, the top 10 reasons why the rich go broke. A lot of people are going broke today. So thank you for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show, and we'll see you next program. Thank you.